I'm James Baylog. I'm the founder and director of the Extreme Life Survey and Earth Vision Institute. I've been an environmental photographer for more than 40 years. In the beginning of my career, I was definitely intensely focused on the outdoors and landscape and adventure, and I was uh, almost uh, magnetically drawn to various environmental stories. Uh, but as a young journeyman photographer, I learned that I, if I wanted to work for magazines and make a living, I need to, needed to shoot a lot of different sorts of things and learn a lot of other subject areas, like, for example, uh, executive portraits or science and technology, you know, working in laboratories and making exotic machinery looking appealing and interesting. Uh, so I did a lot of different things, but always the core theme that took me forward was, uh, was the environment. I was interested in, in photographing hunting, big game hunting, as, uh, as a photojournalist. You know, I was aware uh, of, of the tradition of photojournalism being about people in conflict with people, but um, I realized that there was a whole sector of uh, people in conflict with the rest of nature that I wasn't seeing much in the way of photography of that sort being covered. So I thought, well, there's something there, so why don't I photograph hunting? Now, I had been uh, a hunter when I was young. I hadn't shot an animal for recreation for many years at that point, but it was that background, I suppose, that uh, had me going in that direction, maybe as a sort of a penance, uh, as, a, as a payback for the pointless death I had inflicted on those animals. And uh, in any event, I started to photograph with, uh, with hunters uh, in the Rocky Mountains of the U.S. And that really um, intensified and shaped my thinking about the, uh, the tension between humans and the rest of nature. But when that series was done after about two years, I was thinking, you know, there's a lot more I can do with animals as a, as a subject area or as a symbol. And I don't know what it is. There has to be something beyond bloody pictures of horrible things happening. One day, this was a really, really crucial day, I was at the San Diego Wild Animal Park on a National Geographic assignment to do a picture of a severely endangered animal called an Indian rhinoceros. We were out in this enormous field with all these animals wandering around, and I was shooting from the back of a pickup truck and this rhinoceros came over and rested its chin on the wall of the pickup truck, about literally just that far away from me, a meter, maybe a little bit more than a meter. And he and I sat there staring at each other, uh, just this big wall of rhino skin with this black guy looking at me, and I just barely could breathe, you know? It was like, oh my God, is he gonna charge me or eat me or anything? I didn't know anything about rhinos at that point. I now know he never would have done anything like that, but uh, I was just holding my breath, looking at him, looking at him, looking at him, and he's watching me. And this went on for about 20 minutes, just the two of us staring at each other, this visual interchange. And it was in that moment that I realized um, that there was a different way to look at animals than what we're accustomed to. You know, I had done a lot of traditional wildlife photography at that point in Alaska and in Canada and in Yellowstone National Park, where you're looking through a very long lens and you're trying to um, use the lens to get close and intimate with the animal. And you're also ultimately trying to place the animal in some sort of romantic uh, scene as if the world is a fine and happy place and that bear or that uh, that elk or that deer will have an infinite amount of time and opportunity to go wandering around in pristine landscape. And looking at this rhino, I realized that all of that was wrong, that if you want to speak about endangered wildlife, you need to show them as being alienated from natural habitat. Animals are uh, 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 going extinct and are endangered for their survival because they don't have a place to live, because human encroachment has taken away uh, living space. And that's the main, the main factor in this huge change that's happening in the planet. So this interchange with the rhino made me realize 
changed the dynamics of the picture completely. And I didn't know what that was until that night. I was sitting there in the airport thinking, 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 and I realized, oh my gosh, it's white backgrounds and it's artificial light and it's portraits. And that all came together on that one magical day in 1986 and nothing has been the same ever since. In doing any kind of this work and going to any of these places that we go to, whether, it, whether they're exotic or ordinary in order to shoot these pictures, you have to become really, really aware of the factual reality uh, and the scientific reality of what's happening, whether it's you know, uh, a species going away or the air being changed or the glacier, glaciers being changed or the forest being cut down or whatever. You need to be aware of the details, the factual details of the situation. And it can be a heavy burden to carry those facts at times. Um, it's especially been a burden with, uh, with the glacier work. But I also have another part of my brain that I, that I work from that says it's an incredible privilege and opportunity to have this subject matter at this historic time. You're in the middle of a piece of history, in the middle of something that people will be talking about a very long time from now. You're seeing it, you are in it. And most people can't see it. Most people don't realize they're in it. But as an informed photographer, I'm in it. And those of us who do this kind of work are in it. And that is an amazing thing to feel that electric vibration of history around you sometimes. And that's a lot of what keeps me going and keeps me animated in spite of whatever the other part of my brain might be saying, which is, oh, this is depressing and I'm sad and upset and whatever. It's like, okay, that, that's, that's one thing, but the other thing is be here now and make that picture. I've heard lots and lots of testimony to the effect that my work has made a difference, and I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, back when that endangered species work came out in 1990, uh, people who knew the fields, knew the, uh, knew the documentary uh, photography and magazine fields were saying to me, you've made more of an impact with your work than all the other documentary uh, stories about endangered wildlife have ever done because you've gotten people to think differently and see differently. And I know that also with the, um, the receding glacier work, we've brought in evidence that uh, people could finally comprehend and understand about climate change. You know, climate change had been a, uh, uh, an abstract, uh, almost theoretical issue that was uh, the product of uh, uh, a lot of scientific reports and, and computer models. But with the pictures, common people could see it and understand it. A lot of people don't understand c computer models and statistics, but with the picture, it's like, oh, we get it. It's right there. Okay, fine. So we have definitely participated in, in a shifting of the, uh, the worldwide social perception of the urgency and, uh, and intensity of climate. If I could wave a magic wand and have any possible picture come together, it would be somehow a picture of air. I tried to photograph air through different manifestations for, what was it, six, seven, eight years? And I got some pretty good things, but I don't feel like I quite got everything in that it wasn't quite enough. You know, the, the story of changing air is very much at the center of the climate change story. Everything's happening in this invisible substance that's all around us here, that stands between us all, and you can't see it. So how do you, as a photographer, make a picture of something you can't see? It's incredibly difficult. And like I say, I got a few shots, but there's always something else out there over the horizon. I don't know what it is, but that would be the subject where if all the forces of the universe could somehow reveal a new picture to me, uh, I would hope that it would be around air. Mm -hmm.